Gospel for today is Acts 2, 32 to 33 and 43 to 47. First, a little side commentary. Last week was in church in uh, Long Island, and something was said that hit me pretty strong. Today is Easter, which really doesn't mean a lot to us. Every Sunday is very important to us. Easter, we come every week, every Sunday, to celebrate the uh, crucifixion and resurrection of the Lord. So Easter, you know, you know what I'm saying? Doesn't mean, it's not like the world. The world, the only time they go to church is on Easter, if they go. But to us, we do, every week we celebrate Easter. Acts 2, 32 to 33. This Jesus God raised up again, to which we are all witnesses. Therefore, having been exalted to the right hand of God, and having received from the Father the promise of the Holy Spirit, he has poured forth this which you both see and hear. Everyone is keeping a sense of awe, and many wonders and signs were taking place through the apostles. And all those who had believed were together and had all things in common. And they began selling their property and possessions and were sharing them with all, as anyone might have need. Day by day, continuing with one mind in the temple and breaking bread from house to house, they were taking their meals together with gladness and sincerity of heart, praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord was adding to their number day by day those who were being saved. Amen. It's my role, I guess, as preacher this morning, as preacher in general, to ask some really hard questions from time to time. Some questions that cause folks to examine themselves, examine who and what they are, and where they are. And uh, I don't know as I like that job very much, the hard questions. But the, the glory of that is that I ought not leave you with just the hard question. I ought to be able to follow that up with some encouragement some help, some, some, some excitement somehow or other. And, and I think that's the case today. I hope that it is, and, and that's the intention of it. The hard question this morning is, are you living and standing in the very image of God? I mean, that's what he created us for, right? Way back in Genesis 1. And follow that up maybe is what would that image of God look like in me? What's it supposed to look like in humanity? And I would assert that somehow if I or we, any of us, was standing in the very image of God, that it would somehow embrace the very nature of Almighty God. Somehow I would look like love and truth and purity, and somehow there'd be an irresistible power involved. And that's a pretty big, steep order, and the truth is that it's not humanly possible. And so it shouldn't surprise us that we've messed up, and, and maybe that, that's not a description of us, that we fall far short of that. But in today's Scripture reading that Don shared, here is a people pulling together and helping one another and encouraging one another and honoring the Creator and living in sincerity of heart and loving harmony somehow. And that's unusual amongst humanity. And that looks a lot like what Almighty God intends for us to be like. And the world 
humanity overall has not been what God intends. And I guess we ought to recognize that something more is needed. Throughout the course of creation and history, something is needed. And God has provided that start over, that new beginning, that makeover in Christ Jesus, in Emmanuel, in God with us. God has provided a human like us who is able to stand and live in the very image of God, Jesus Christ. Through His sacrifice and His resurrection and the commensurate outpouring of His Spirit, there's the good news. After the hard question comes the good news. God has enabled and provided us this new beginning, this enablement to stand in the image of God. That's the good news. And we need to somehow embrace that, to enjoin that. We need to participate in that good news and not just simply hear it. God has enabled us, and so folks, let's move forward. Let's solve some of those spiritual and moral problems that folks have lived out and experienced throughout the whole Old Testament. Let's be transformed into and live in the very image of Almighty God. Folks, if we would be a part of this good news, this new beginning, there are some things that we ought to understand, and maybe that'll help us along the way. We ought to understand that when we hear that good news and embrace that good news, that life is not life as usual. It ought not continue amongst us as Christians as the same old, same old. What God makes good news, what makes the good news of God work, is that something new is available to us. There is an empowerment of some sort. You know, the disciples were told to do nothing until they received power from on high. Back in Luke 24, the Lord is speaking, verse 46, He said to them, the disciples, Thus it is written that the Christ would suffer and rise again from the dead the third day, that repentance and forgiveness of sins would be proclaimed in His name to all the nations. Now we think of that as nations. The word is ethnos, which means every ethnic group in addition to the Jews. So I'm an ethnic group. We're an ethnic group different than the nations. That, that, so that's all peoples. Beginning from Jerusalem, verse 48, you are witnesses of these things. And behold, I am sending forth the promise my, of my Father upon you, but you're to stay in the city until you're clothed with power from on high. And so in Acts chapter 2, that power, that Holy Spirit is poured out upon them. And all kinds of different things begin to happen by the power of the Lord. And one of the things we ought to understand as we work through here is that what's going on here in the Scripture and what we see as this empowerment of people, this transformation, it's more than that they've been taught new ideas. They've got a new way of thinking, right? Right? They've had some of these old mysteries explained and we say, aha, and everything's new. It's more than that. There's a power here, an enablement from God. So don't think that you can do this on your own. That you can be transformed to where you live moment to moment the rest of your life in the very image of God. You can't do that on your own. Here's this Spirit of God being poured out, and somehow we need to understand that we need God's help. God has provided His very Spirit to empower us. And so Acts chapter 1, gathering them together, the disciples, the apostles technically, He commanded them not to leave Jerusalem, but to wait for what the Father had promised, which He said, you heard of from me, for John baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. Then down into verse 8. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you shall be my witnesses both in Jerusalem and in Judea and Samaria and even the remotest part of the earth. Now these words, I understand, 
technically are probably spoken to the apostles, and primarily to the apostles at least, but yes, also to all of us, I would assert in some sense, because those apostles are representatives of the whole church. And this promise, this empowerment from Almighty God is in some way available to each and every one of us. The Spirit is available. The very indwelling of Almighty God is available to live and dwell within us, corporately and within you personally, to enable what God wants us to do. This empowerment comes through the presence of the Holy Spirit, which was poured out and made available to us and into which we've been baptized. Without God, we can do little or nothing. The Spirit in us is God with us. And folks, if God is with us, all things are possible. So it starts out there, and they spoke in different languages, and there were healings and signs and wonders, and God's presence and God's power are evident, and these all came according to as how the Holy Spirit de determined, not according to as how man wanted or man determined. They're there. They're evidence of the, the Holy Spirit. There's even a more pervading demonstration of power, I would suggest, and that is the presence of that love and that harmony, that Spirit of God dwelling amongst the people and between them. And folks in Acts chapter 2 are different than what they were. They're growing in the very nature of Almighty God. There's personal transformation in the lives of folks. Enemies become friends. The covetous become generous. There's amazing caring and sharing, speaking, teaching, living truth and godliness, and it is empowered by God. It's not just that they think different about things now. There's an enablement that comes from Almighty God, Emmanuel, God with us. And the biggest, the most powerful manifestation of this, I would suggest, is God's presence in you, Christian, you are supposed to live by the Spirit. And you know you can't do that on your own. It's not up to you. This empowerment comes from the Father. You can't just say, okay, I'm going to do this and go do it. You need help from God. And yet, on the other hand, it is up to you. You have a choice whether or not to follow the Spirit's leadings to be empowered and changed and transformed or not. And so the apostle says in Galatians 5, walk by the Spirit and you'll not carry out the desire of the flesh. For the flesh sets its desire against the Spirit and the Spirit against the flesh. For these are in opposition to one another so that you may not do the things that you please. And maybe you've experienced that tug of war between the flesh and the Spirit. The choice to participate in the good news, to live by the Spirit, is somehow yours. If you choose to heed, to listen, to follow, to submit to God's presence and God's gift, then it will be seen in you. So don't resist the Spirit. Cooperate. Complete the changes. That, you know, you, that when you feel that in your conscience, when you feel the Spirit of God working on you, when you say, oh yeah, this would be a godly thing. Pay attention to that. Be susceptible to that. You are supposed to be different than you were. Christ is risen. God in the Spirit is now with you always, intimately within you and amongst His people. That means personal changes. That means new beginnings. The good news message is not just words preached though those words are powerful. The message is to be seen as it's lived out in the lives of folks in whom the very presence of God dwells. So are you different than you were? Are you still self-centered, like maybe we used to be, and covetous, like I used to be? Or is that unselfish love of God 
clearly seen and growing? Do you go out of your way to help folks? Do you go out of your way to help folks that you really don't like? You know, folks that rub you the wrong way and irritate you maybe. Uh, we're supposed to love our enemies. Is an amazing ability to forgive folks becoming evident in your life? And that show of God's grace. Do you go out of your way to fellowship and encourage folks spiritually? Is there a conviction within you to resist evil? Is there a conviction to find and follow truth? You know, <clears throat> spoke about it in the class this morning that uh, there are lots of folks who call themselves Christians. And uh, unfortunately, as you look, you see a life surrounded by controversy and conflict and strife. And you have to ask, how can that be true if the Spirit of God is present there? Galatians 5 says the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such things there is no law. That ought to be the nature and the feel of the individuals and the body. Now those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. If we live by the Spirit, let us walk by the Spirit. You see that recognition of a personal choice in that verse? Because there are some who are not doing that. Understand that it is possible to resist the Spirit, to squelch the Spirit. That God has made that promise, that gift available to folks. And some folks accepted it. And then as I read through Galatians, I see that they had the Spirit, but somehow they were led astray. They had that gift from God, but that doesn't mean you always hang on to that. You have to keep choosing that somehow. In, uh, in Galatians 5, 7, the apostle says, to these who were, he says, you were running well, who hindered you from obeying the truth? And you see, somehow these folks had the idea, they had the concept that they need to rely on the Spirit of God, but somehow, in this case, they had stopped relying on the empowerment by God and the grace of God, and they were trying to accomplish it themselves again. Without God, it doesn't work that way. Let's not do that. You know, it's normal, fleshly, to uh, try to make all things work ourselves, to be in charge. You know, to try to accomplish the things that we know ought to be there. And sometimes we take that personal control and we forget to let the Spirit do His work. And that may be in our own lives and the transformation within us. And it may be in our attempting to impact other folks. We need to rely on God to wait patiently on God, to look for His direction, to let Him take charge and take the lead. The very presence of God dwells within us if we are genuinely His. And folks, that's power. That's empowerment, enablement. Now, often, I would share that that power of God, even in our own lives, doesn't work the way we expect. You know, I've got the power of God working in me, and that means I want to wave my magic wand and make everything right in your life, but ching right? And I've got the power of God working in me, and here's a financial struggle, so here's my magic wand, but ching uh, No, I'm not in charge. That power of God is at work, but it's God who's in charge, and He works that power as He wants, not how I declare and how I want. Sometimes I need to wait for Him to do it His way, and sometimes His way is entirely different than what I had in mind. If you're living by the Spirit, the presence of God will be seen and felt, and we ought to recognize that it happens through the influence of His people. The presence of God is in Walmart. 
when Christians are letting God work through them when they're in Walmart or in your home or in your family or wherever. Let God work through you. And this new empowerment that I've asserted is manifested in individuals is also seen by God's presence in the church. We're talking about God living in His people collectively. God with us, that's the body of Christ on earth, the fullness of Him who fills all in all. And so we become, as the church, the chosen race, the royal priesthood, the holy nation, the people for God's own possession, so that we can proclaim the excellencies of Him who called us out of darkness into His marvelous light. And each one of us, each believer is supposed to be a part of that overall universal concept. Early disciples were told that they were witnesses of what God did in Christ, and so are we. And God is to be visibly present in congregational life. Acts 2, 44, those who believed were together and had all things in common, began selling their property and possessions, sharing them with all as anyone might have need. Can you imagine that? That generosity, day by day, continuing with one mind. Hard to get two folks together and be of one mind. And here's the whole body. They know what they're about primarily. And breaking bread from house to house, taking meals together with gladness and sincerity of heart, praising God, having favor with all the people, the Lord adding to their number day by day. You know, those who think that they can do it without church, they're missing something. We're supposed to be working together to accomplish God's plan. Ephesians 4, speaking the truth in love, we're to grow up in all aspects into Him who's head, even Christ, from whom the whole body, being fitted and held together by what every joint supplies, according to the proper working of each individual, causes the growth of the body for the building up of itself in love. You see, each one partaking for the benefit of all. Romans 12, 5, We who are many are one body in Christ and individually members one of another. That kind of goes against our American ego, doesn't it? I want to stand independent. And God is saying, ah, somehow we fit together. We're part of one another. There's a corporate life that is the fullness of Christ alive, His body here on earth. There are things that go on when we work together as a unit that don't happen when we're alone. And maybe there are folks who have been soured by religion. Yeah. Soured by church because they've had bad experiences with folks. And that happens. But I would encourage you, don't try to outsmart or sidestep God's plan. That congregational life is part of God's plan. And that growth and that Christ-likeness comes through working through people conflicts and loving each other in a body life. And I'm not going to judge anybody's salvation, but if folks are not active in church, they're missing something that God intends for them to get for their growth and their blessing and their transformation. Here is where you encourage one another, where you receive that valid and appropriate guidance and correction and nurturing that you might not find or even think of working on spirituality by yourself. The goal of church, the goal of assembling is generous. It's not selfish. You know, when we say things like, Man, I didn't get much out of that. Uh, or I really enjoyed that service. You know, that I part. That's not what Christ has in mind at all. We're not supposed to be thinking about I. We're supposed to be thinking about others if the Spirit of Christ dwells within us. So Hebrews 10, let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering, for he who promised is faithful, and let us consider how to stimulate one another to love and good deeds, not forsaking your own 
assembling together, as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another. And all the more as you see the day drawing near. You see, faith comes from faith. And we're here to support and encourage others. That's what it's about. The image of Christ is social. You can't fully witness to Christ in solitude. He reached out to others. He taught others. He was engaged with others. He cared for others. He loved for others. And if anybody really has the heart of Christ and the spirit of Christ, uh, doesn't work to avoid being with people. Folks, God provided us a new beginning. Good news. You know, that good news has been around. That good news that Jesus was crucified and resurrected and risen. That's been, I guess, a little over 2,000 years, something like that, isn't it? Doesn't seem like good news has been around that long. Now, at least not new news, but if you are not personally walking in the image of Christ, if you are not personally in an intimate, personal relationship with God, or if you've messed up and need a renewal, then that good news is there today. It's new, and it is new over and over again. It enables the transformation of people into the very image of God so that they can present the reality of God and the nature of God to the world. That good news is yours today through a risen Savior, and you are invited to be a part of it. That good news. Pray with me. Father, we open our hearts to you. We pray, Father, that you would enable us with your spirit. Help us to be sensitive, to listen, to feel, to be aware of your promptings and your leadings. Empower us to be what you would have us be. In the name of Christ, amen. Folks, we're going to have a closing song in a minute if we can be of service to you, if we can share faith, if we can encourage and nurture, if we can be of an assistance. We think primarily in spiritual ways, but it fits physical too because the two are entangled. If we can be of a help to you in any way, now is the time as we close with a song and a prayer. Amen. John. In 1988, our vacation Bible school, the first year as a member of the church, they, uh, they dressed me up in an ear of corn. You probably, they did. Yeah. <laughs> Revelations chapter 3, it talks about, uh, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in to him. And will dine with him and he with me. He who overcomes, I will grant him to sit down with me on my throne. And I also overcame and sat down with my father on his throne. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Jesus is calling us. We need to hear that. Uh, we sing... We used to sing a song, Jesus is calling today, calling today. Well, Jesus is calling us, and he's pleading with us, and he's waiting with us. Our closing song is number 226. The verse says, here I am, Lord, send me. So those with ears, we should be able to hear what Jesus is saying to us today. Let us stand and sing number 226.